Welcome. God bless you. Thank you for joining and listening in. Uh, this is the second message in our three-part series on the three selahs of Psalm 46. Um, let me encourage you just in another, uh, again, just to um, be reading your Bibles and then memorize and meditate, study, think on those things that are in the Scriptures. And I said, well, where do you start? I think I said last time. And I don't really know. Uh, you know, this is the perfect place to start. But I know this, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. You can go anywhere in this book and it'll benefit you in the Bible. So I just encourage you to do that. And I, I also, you don't need to know a lot. There's so much to know. If you live to be a thousand, you'd continue learning. But you do need to know a little well. Choose a few verses. Ask God to guide you. And uh, go to a few scriptures and get them down. Know them. I've heard it said, maybe you have as well, that if you memorize a verse, you learn a thought of God. If you memorize a section, you begin to learn how God thinks. And I think there's some truth to that. You see the flow of things, but whether it's a verse or a section of verses, I would encourage you to memorize some scripture, Psalms 119, 105. My word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. As things are, especially in a dark world, it's important to have light. In Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19, I don't want to mess this up. I have it memorized, but I'm going to make sure I say this right. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, unto which you would do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth into a dark place, <clears throat> until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts. In the Psalms, it also says, At the entrance of thy word giveth light. More important than our words and talking to somebody about the Lord, share his words. His word is living and powerful. And it's hard to share it if you don't know what that word is. I recently read in the news from Israel this comment. I just love it. It says, if you read the news, you'll know what's going on in the world. But if you read your Bible, you'll know why. Drum roll that. If you read your Bibles, you study, you memorize, meditate the things of the Bible, you'll know why things are going on the way they're going on. They've been told in advance. So just encourage you. The days, it's always been the case for the church and any believers to know what the Word of God has to say. He has given us His Word and become students uh, of the Word of God. Well, by way of review in Psalm 46, I'm going to quote those first few verses for you again and make a couple comments, and then we'll go right ahead with the next four verses and the second selah. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. These two comments. God is, that was the title of our first message, God is our refuge and strength. God is who he says he is and he will do what he says he will do. Then it says, therefore, in light of that, we will not fear that choice. Fear is a reaction. Courage is a decision. Well, let's go on to these next four verses. And I would encourage you, if you haven't listened to that first message, that you listen to that. It kind of sets the stage for the remainder of these next two messages. Well, verse 4 says, There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High God is, there it is again, <clears throat> God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted, 
The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Well, there is a river. God is, there is a river. This may not sound too profound. I'm going to say it anyway. Where there's a river, there's water. And where there's water, there's life. They didn't say there is a river bed, dried up. There is a river, a flowing river. I'd like to take more time than we are, we're going to allow ourselves here to talk about the importance of water. The Holy Spirit is referred to as a well of water springing up into life everlasting, like a river of water that flows to us. Well, there is a river. The last message in the Bible, this is where we're going to go. We don't exhaust these. <clears throat> this is poetry of epic proportion. This is in the, the categories that uh, in Schofield in the front of my Bible, he has kind of categorized the divisions of Scripture, like the uh, first five books would be under the law, Mount Sinai, Ten Commandments, and then Joshua through Esther would be the history of Israel, the nation of Israel. And then from Job through Song of Solomon would be the books of poetry and of wisdom. This is in that category. And then, of course, from Isaiah through Malachi is the, the prophets, the law and the prophets. And then the Gospels, if you want to move into the New Testament, is the manifestation of all the Old Testament. Jesus on the road to Emmaus, the two on the road to Emmaus, in Luke 24, 22, he says, And Jesus expounded unto them, beginning at Moses, through all of the prophets, the things concerning himself. You want to know what the Bible's about? It's about God in Jesus Christ. It's the message of the sacrificial. It's about the Lord Jesus. So when you get to the Gospels, He's telling you what that whole Old Testament was about. Then you get to Acts, that's kind of the propagation. Pentecost, Holy Spirit comes to dwell within believers, it explodes. This is his message of grace to the world. The epistles basically are, how do you live this thing called the Christian life? Ha! It explains the things. It's a, the explanations of what God has done, what he is doing. And then, of course, Revelation is the consummation, eternity, the end of the age. World passes away, eternity begins. The Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, happens in Revelation as well. With that said, in Psalm here, this what we're going to look at is poetry of epic and wisdom that is there. And it is worthy of pondering and of thinking upon. Well, here it is. There's a river. Where there's a river, there's water. Where there's water, there's life. The last message of the Bible in Revelation is chapter 22. Look at what it says. I just want to read these to you. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life, which bore twelve kinds of fruit, and yielded her fruit every month. The leaves and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. Hallelujah. <laughs> Whom having not seen, have never seen, but the day is coming, will see his face. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and there shall be no need of a lamp, neither of light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. I want to... Look at the last a part of that section. In verse 16 it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root of the offspring of David and the bride and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who heareth say, Come. Here's the part I like. And let him who is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. And then you've only got four verses left. Revelation is over. At the end of everything, this is a picture. There is a river of God extending freely the gift of salvation to humanity. If you're thirsty, come and drink. It's free. When I think of Romans 3, 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There is a river. The 
The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. So much more we can do with this, but I want to take a look at the holy place of the tabernacles. What came to mind was 2 Corinthians 5, 1. For we know that if this early earthly house of this tabernacle, which is a dwelling place of God, of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God not made with hands eternal in the heavens. It says we even groan, we long for that day. The believer does. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, What know you not that your body, the holy place of the tabernacles, there's a river, life giving pure crystal. The holy place of the tabernacles, that's where the dwelling place of God is of the Most High. Why? Because God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved, God shall help her in that right early. These thoughts. God is in the midst of her. You want to know what makes there is a river, the water, the tabernacle of the Most High? Why she won't be moved? Because God's in the midst of her. God is, there it is, God is in the midst of her. Well, I can tell you right now, it is directly referring to, is, excuse me, to Jerusalem, not to Israel. Israel's always referred to in the masculine, but Jerusalem is referred to as feminine. God is in the midst of her. It's very similar to when God refers to the church, Christ, the bridegroom, the head of, and the bride, his church. And I think you can make some comparisons. And I think this has prophetic overturn, overtures to it with reference to the New Testament. This is one book. The Bible is one book. And it is about Christ. God is in the midst of her. <clears throat> These comments. Jerusalem, the greatest city on earth. What makes her great is God's city. God is in the midst of her. It's called the holy city. It's called the city of Zion, the city of David. The city of the great king, it will not be moved. You do not have to worry about the fate of Jerusalem. In Isaiah 31, 5, and there are other many other verses that make reference to this. Listen to this. As Isaiah 31, 5, as birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it. And passing over, he will preserve it. Don't worry about Jerusalem. She ain't going to be moved. The greatest events in all of his story, which is the Bible, history, occurred in Jerusalem. Jesus died in Jerusalem. He was buried in Jerusalem. He rose again in Jerusalem. That's the gospel. He will one day return to the city of Jerusalem. One day there will be a new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. Don't worry about Jerusalem. There's great security in that. It is not left to the fate of man and what we decide we are going to do with Jerusalem. No, it's his, her. It's his, it's his favorite city in the greatest city on earth. By the way, don't worry about the church. You may think the church is all failing. Christ is building his church. There's still people being saved and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. No more than they will against Jerusalem. Well, let's go on to a couple more verses. Verses 6 and 7, the nations rage. Now, this is really poetry of epic proportion. What is covered in here would take days to begin to unpack. We'll take just a few glimpses and thoughts. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Ponder these thoughts. Psalm 2 says, Why do the nations rage and the people imagine a vain things? And then he tells why. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break his, their bands asunder. Let us cast their cords off. We want, we want our own freedom. We want to determine our own life. We don't want God telling us what to do. He who sits in the heavens As if man could say to God, we don't want you. And yet he can. But he's, God still is. 
Rebellion, man's rebellion. We see the nature of man, the nation's rage, the kingdoms. The book of Daniel talks about kings and kingdoms more than any other book of the Bible. Basically, God sets them up. He also takes them down. We had given to us in advance in Daniel the kingdoms of this world. And that's what, there's been no other world kingdoms but the ones mentioned. Babylonian, Medo-Persian, the Greeks and the Romans were living in that era. The kingdoms of this world. In Revelations chapter 11, let me give you this. The seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world or the kingdom of this world is become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Lord's Prayer, many familiar with this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Everybody knows what's next. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. His eternal kingdom. I almost laugh at the lunacy of Satan as he takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and shows him the kingdoms of, of the world. How this happened, I don't know, but he did it. And he said, all of these will I give you if you bow down and worship me. I can't help but think inside Jesus must have laughed. They were already his. He knows the end of the story. The kingdoms. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. Kingdoms, world kingdoms. He uttered his voice. This thought came to mind. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. A number of thoughts. I'm trying to shrink them. It's Sinai, remember in the Old Testament? When God said, gather around the mountain, but don't touch it, and I'll speak to you. And he spoke to them that first time. with It sounded like thunder and lightning and claps, and they were terrified. And they went to Moses and says, you talk to him, and you come tell us what he has to say. But well, we are terrified at the voice of the Lord. But here's this, he uttered his voice. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. There's a day we'll hear his voice. We can hear his voice now. He does speak. His spirit does bear witness with our spirit. God speaks to us. He speaks to us through his word. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his hand. He speaks to us. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. You can check that out. It really means the earth melted. 2 Peter 3.10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in it shall be burned up. The Lord of hosts is with us. The Lord of hosts, the angelic, the unseen realm that God said he made things visible and invisible. Uh, my favorite picture of this is Elisha on Mount Dothan, which is between Shechem and Megiddo, if you went like this, in Israel, central Israel. They're surrounded. And he's not concerned. Elisha's not concerned. And his servant is terrified. So what are we going to do? And he says, well, there's more with us than there are with them. He understood this. And he thought, you've got to be crazy. And he prayed a prayer. Oh, God, open his eyes that he can see. And God took the blinders off, and he could see the unseen realm. And Elisha was surrounded with horses and chariots of fire and the heavenly host, of whom Michael is the captain, but he answers to the general, the commander-in-chief, God himself. And God has at his disposal, there's more with us than there are with them. That's a good thing to remember. When the powers of darkness assault you and I, there's more with us than there are with them. It's a spiritual battle. It's not flesh and blood. But we are already more than conquerors. The Lord of hosts.
hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Everything in our Christian life is inseparably related to Israel. The church did not replace Israel. The promises God made to Israel will be fulfilled in a millennial period after the tribulation. The saints have been raptured. The tribulation period occurs and he is going to fulfill every promise he made to Israel in a thousand years. And Christ himself will be the ruler. And he will rule with a rod of iron. And it will be a time, a lot of mystery about it, but it will be a time. Everything, the God of Jacob is the God of eternity. Oh, that's why we need to know our Bibles. What strengthens our faith is to see God's hand Adam, Abel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, know Israel, know your Bibles, strengthens our faith. It's his story. And he is the one, the God of Jacob, is the one who is our refuge and strength. I am encouraged to know that the great God of all eternity has given us a book in which we can know him. Until then, Selah, ponder, reflect, meditate on the Word of God. God bless.